World War III is not going to start because of tweets telling us about an assassination. It's the assassination that starts World War III. It's the coup that starts World War III. It's the invasion that starts World War III. Not us knowing about it. People in government are blaming the discovery of their actions for conflict instead of the actions themselves. And when you look at it from the company's perspectives, what are the social media company employees supposed to do when the government requests censorship thousands upon thousands of times? Tell the Justice Department, Department of Homeland Security, Defense Department, State Department, Treasury Department, Health and Human Services Department, the CIA and members of Congress to just f*** off? Would any company be able to withstand that kind of pressure or be wise to do so? I don't think so. This is a First Amendment issue, an issue of government censorship. I am so damn tired of being lied to. I don't think I can deny it anymore. You can't stick to your story if you think. Hello, my friend, and thank you for listening to the 270th episode of Congressional Dish. I'm your host, Jennifer Briney. If this is your first time listening to the show, thanks for checking it out. And this is a podcast about what Congress does after the elections, when they have the job and they're using the incredible power of government to shape our society. Today's episode is going to examine the recent disturbing trend of people within government, some elected, but many who are not who are using the social media companies to censor what we can and cannot say on the internet, using their contacts within these private companies to get around the First Amendment to the Constitution. Now, in a lot of ways, this episode is going to be a follow-up to an episode I made years ago. It was the social media censorship episode. That episode is one I produced in November of 2020 after social media corporations prohibited us from sharing a New York Post article about the contents of Hunter Biden's abandoned laptop. For those of you who have been living under a rock, Hunter Biden is President Biden's fuck up son. But after that happened via that episode, we learned that the private social media corporations were cooperating with government. So that isn't really news. Here's Nathaniel Gleischer, who is to this day still the head of security policy at Meta, which is the company that owns Facebook and Instagram. Here he is testifying to Congress in the summer of 2020, just a few months before the last presidential election. Congressman, the collaboration within industry and with government is much, much better than it was in 2016. I think we have found the FBI, for example, to be forward leaning and ready to share information with us when they see it. We share information with them whenever we see indications of foreign interference targeting our election. The best case study for this was the 2018 midterms, where you saw industry, government and civil society all come together sharing information to tackle these threats. We had a case on literally the eve of the vote where the FBI gave us a tip about a network of accounts where they identified subtle links to Russian actors. We were able to investigate those and take action on them within a matter of hours. And so we've known because they told us that the private social media companies have been partners in censorship with the government for years now. But as you heard in that clip and in the social media censorship episode, We've been consistently told that the reason for the censorship has been to secure our elections. Well, in the last few weeks, by watching two recent congressional hearings and reading the Twitter files, I learned that the censorship partnership has evolved into something far more sinister than I imagined it could become in such a short time. It has evolved into a partnership that directly threatens this podcast and my livelihood. And since you are the producer and marketer of this podcast, since you are as much a part of this ad-free listener-supported podcast as I am, I figured this is something that you might give a shit about. But more importantly, bigger picture, the corporate government censorship partnership directly threatens the ability of anyone who wants to share information that governments, politicians, and corporations prefer we not know. And if you value independent sources of information... You need to hear this and help fight it in any way you can, because way too many members of Congress are either dismissing this as a silly non-issue or straight up hostile to those sounding the alarm. 
the people that we need to fix this either don't get it or are part of the problem. And today I'm going to show you what I mean. Before I do that, though, I made a mistake in the last episode that I need to tell you about. I need to eat some crow. Yum, yum, yum. In that episode, which was a summary of this year's NDAA, the annual law that authorizes our war activities, I was talking about our country's foreign military financing programs. And I played a clip from a senator who told us the number of them that exist right now. And even though the real number was in that clip, the senator said it, I, after that, emphasized that there was an insane 170 programs that involve us American taxpayers providing weapons and funding and even training foreign fighters. Except there are actually 107 security assistance programs, not 170. <laughs> Which is still a crazy high number, 107. But it is a different number. And so uh, this is my whoopsie. And I am sorry about that. And thank you to the kind soul who pointed out the mistake for not only letting me know, but for also not being a dick about it. I appreciate you. Okay, but back to the topic of today. So most of the new information that you're going to hear both in Congress and in my stories today are going to come from the Twitter files. The Twitter files are an enormous batch of internal Twitter documents that were given to a small group of journalists after weirdo billionaire Elon Musk bought his favorite social media platform at the end of October of last year and set out to expose what was going on at the company before he took it over. And when I say these journalists were given access to an enormous batch of documents, here are the numbers that lead me to call the batch enormous. Here's Representative Stacey Plaskett of Florida speaking to two of the journalists who were given the documents and have been reporting on their findings. So first up, there were two journalists that were testifying to Congress, and one of them who you're going to hear first is Michael Schellenberger. And some listeners might remember this guy because he testified to Congress before, and I, I don't want to make any, any enemies here, and I think he's done good work on the Twitter files, but for this audience, he didn't leave a great first impression. His testimony was highlighted in the episode about the massive power outage that happened in Texas. It was episode 231. And he said so many things to Congress that I knew to be inaccurate about renewable energy because he's a pro-nuclear activist. He's really into nuclear power. But I actually re-watched the hearing in my green room with my husband, who is an expert in renewable energy, just to make sure that I wasn't losing my mind. And in fact, Michael Schellenberger was full of shit when it came to his not a facts about renewable energy. And so Michael Schellenberger, to be honest with you, is not on my trusted sources list. But luckily, when it comes to the Twitter files, like I said, they've done good work and they brought the receipts. And so anything I highlight today that relies on the word of Michael Schellenberger, I have checked out for myself within the Twitter files, which of course I have linked to for you in the show notes along with all of the rest of my sources. But the majority of the testimony you're going to hear today is going to come from the other Twitter files journalist who was invited to testify to Congress, Matt Taibbi. And Matt Taibbi is one of my favorite journalists for approximately the last 20 years. I have never caught him lying. And even better, when he makes a mistake, he admits it. And I've actually modeled my own behavior on this because I want to build the same type of relationship of trust with you that Matt has developed over the years with his readers. And in the hierarchy of people that I trust the most as sources of information, Matt Taibbi is near the top. And so you're going to hear a lot of testimony from him today. And so here is some of that testimony. Here's Representative Stacey Plaskett of Florida speaking first to Michael Schellenberger and then to Matt Taibbi in their March 9th testimony to the House Judiciary Committee's new subcommittee, the Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. How many emails did Mr. Musk give you access to? I mean, we... We, we went through thousands of emails. Did he give you access to all of the emails for the time we, period in which? Yeah, I, we never had a single, I never had a single request denied. And not only that, but the amount of files that we were given were so voluminous that there mm -hmm. was no way that anybody could have gone through them beforehand. And we never found an instance where anything, there was any evidence that anything had been taken out. Okay, so you would, you would believe that you have probably millions of emails and documents Right? That's correct, would you uh, say? I don't know. No, I think the number's Sounds less too high. high. Yeah. Okay, 100,000? That's probably closer. Probably, yeah. probably close to 100,000 that both of you are seeing. And here's Matt Taibbi summarizing what he has witnessed in the last five months within the approximately 100,000 documents that have been nicknamed the Twitter files. 
The original promise of the internet was that it might democratize the exchange of information globally. A free internet would overwhelm all attempts to control information flow, its very existence a threat to anti-democratic forms of government everywhere. What we found in the files was a sweeping effort to reverse that promise and use machine learning and other tools to turn the internet into an in instrument of censorship and social control. Unfortunately, our own government appears to be playing a lead role. We saw the first hints in communications between Twitter executives before the 2020 election when we read things like flag by DHS or please see attached report from FBI for potential misinformation. This would be attached to an Excel spreadsheet with a long list of names whose accounts were often suspended shortly after. One very illustrative example of the government playing a disguised but key role in the censorship decisions of private social media companies is the censorship of the article about the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop that took place a few weeks before the 2020 election. And because we've already done a whole episode about this, we might as well finish the story. Because regardless of what you think about Joe Biden or Donald Trump or Hunter Biden and his drugs or his sex or his business dealings, all of those characters and in intriguing storylines are beside the point here. The point is that in the weeks before an election, private companies that have become the public square of the internet collectively decided to hide information from us. Information that was about the family that Americans were at that very moment trying to decide whether or not they trust to be the most powerful family on earth. And it doesn't really matter who the characters are. What matters is whether Americans have a right to see and share information with each other, especially before an election. And in this case, private companies decided, at least for a little while, that the answer was no. And here's the internal reasoning behind that decision at Twitter. Here's Vijaya Gad. She is testifying on February 8th to the House Oversight Committee. And she was the chief legal officer at Twitter before Elon Musk took over and fired her. But she was the one who made the decision to censor that story on Twitter. On October 14th, 2020, the New York Post tweeted articles about Hunter Biden's laptop with embedded images that look like they may have been obtained through hacking. In 2018, we had developed a policy intended to to prevent Twitter from becoming a dumping ground for hacked materials. We applied this policy to the New York Post tweets and blocked links to the articles embedding those source materials. At no point did Twitter otherwise prevent tweeting, reporting, discussing, or describing the contents of Mr. Biden's laptop. People could and did talk about the contents of the laptop on Twitter or anywhere else, including other much larger platforms, but they were prevented from sharing the primary documents on Twitter. Still, over the course of that day, it became clear that Twitter had not fully appreciated the impact of that policy on free press and others. As Mr. Dorsey testified before Congress on multiple occasions, Twitter changed its policy within 24 hours and admitted its initial action was wrong. This policy revision immediately allowed people to tweet the original articles with the embedded source materials. Relying on its longstanding practice not to retroactively apply new policies, Twitter informed the New York Post that it could immediately begin tweeting when it deleted the original tweets, which would have freed them to retweet the same content again. The New York Post chose not to delete its original tweets, so Twitter made an exception after two weeks to retroactively apply the new policy to the Post's tweets. In hindsight, Twitter should have reinstated the Post account immediately. There's one sentence there that I feel like I need to highlight. She said, quote, we had developed a policy intended to prevent Twitter from becoming a dumping ground of hacked materials, unquote. That's why all of this happened. And on that basis, they blocked the story about Hunter Biden from being shared. Now, putting aside the reality for a moment that the laptop and its contents weren't hacked materials, let's marinate on the policy for a moment. Because there is nothing illegal about reporting on the contents of hacked materials. In fact, reporting on hacked materials has provided us with some of the most crucial information that Americans and citizens around the world have been given to help us all understand how this world is really being run. The Pentagon Papers were essentially hacked materials that told us necessary truths about how the United States ended up at war in Vietnam. The government sued the journalists publishing the stories about the Pentagon Papers, and the government lost the case with the Supreme Court allowing the publication of the information to continue. Then there's the documents that Edward Snowden took, 
Those were hacked materials. And those exposed the international spying network funneling digital information about all of us to the government, a network that these very same social media corporations and others were a part of. Now, Edward Snowden used his position as a contractor doing work outsourced by the Defense Department's National Security Agency to steal those documents. And stealing the documents is a crime, and that's why Edward Snowden lives in Russia now. But Glenn Greenwald is constitutionally protected in his reporting on those documents, which is why Glenn Greenwald did so and remains a free man allowed to be within the United States whenever he pleases. And the emails taken by Russians from the computers used by people at the Democratic National Committee, the headquarters of the Democratic Party, and emails taken from Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta, which were made public by WikiLeaks on social media platforms, including Twitter, in the months before 2016. Those emails were real, and they proved that the DNC was running an unfair primary, quite literally paid for and designed to anoint Hillary Clinton as the nominee. Well, those were hacked materials, too. Stealing them was a crime, but we are free to look at them, share them, and report on them once they're public. Here's Matt Taibbi testifying to Congress on March 9th. In the first Twitter files, we saw an exchange between Representative uh, Rohana and uh, Vijaya God, uh, where he's trying to explain the basics of speech law uh, in, in America. And she's completely, she seems completely unaware of what, for instance, New York Times v. Sullivan is. Uh, there are other cases like Bartnicki v. Vopper, which legalize uh, the publication of stolen material. That's very important for any journalist to know. I think most of these people are tech executives and they don't know what the law is around uh, speech and around reporting. And in this case, and in 2016, you were dealing with true material. There is no basis to restrict the publication of true material, no matter who the source is uh, and how you get it. Um, and journalists have always understood that. Uh, and this has never been an issue or a controversial issue uh, until very recently. But regardless of that right to share information, regardless of its origin, Twitter, after Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 election, which the Democrats largely blamed the hacked emails for, not themselves for rigging their own primary, but the hacked emails for telling us about it. And after the pressure campaign, we heard ourselves in the social media censorship episode, which was applied to the CEOs of the social media corporations by the pro-censorship wing of Congress. After all that, Twitter created a policy that prohibits the sharing of hacked materials on their site, which they are free to do as a private company. As many Democrats pointed out in these hearings, here's Representative Jamie Raskin of Maryland in the February 8th hearing with the ex-Twitter employees. What's more, Twitter's editorial decision has been analyzed and debated ad nauseum. Some people think it was the right decision. Some people think it was the wrong decision. But the key point here is that it was Twitter's decision. Twitter is a private media company. In America, private media companies can decide what to publish or how to curate content however they want. If Twitter wants to have nothing but tweets commenting on New York Post articles run all day, it can do that. If it makes such tweets mentioned in the New York Post uh, never see the light of day, they could do that too. That's what the First Amendment means. And he's right. What is unconstitutional is the government censoring speech. And in the case of the Hunter Biden laptop, well, here's Representative Becca Belint of Virginia questioning Vijaya Gad, who's the old Twitter's chief legal officer. Um, Ms. Gaddy, did anyone from the Biden campaign or the Democratic National Committee direct Twitter to remove or take action against the New York Post story? No. And in watching all the testimony and reading through the Twitter files, I didn't see anything that would dispute that. No one in government or in the Biden campaign directly told Twitter to remove or hide the Hunter Biden laptop story. But the Twitter files did tell us that there's more to the story. It's more nuanced than that. Because it turns out that the FBI had the actual laptop. In April 2019, Hunter Biden had taken the laptop to a repair shop and just left it there. And eventually the shop owner turned it over to the FBI. In 2019, that's a year before the election and a year before the New York Post article was released. And so the FBI knew exactly where the laptop came from and knew exactly what was on it. 
They also knew that Rudy Giuliani, a servant of then President Donald Trump, had access to the contents of that laptop, too, which makes the FBI's actions in the following year look pretty damn suspicious, because here's what Mark Zuckerberg, the creator and CEO of Facebook, testified to Congress in October of 2020, just a week after the New York Post story about Hunter's laptop was hidden from us by the social media corporations. And in this clip, he's answering questions posed by Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Uh, Senator, as I testified before, we relied heavily on the FBI's uh, intelligence and alerts to us, both through their public testimony and uh, private briefings well, and alerts did, they did, gave us. Did the FBI contact you and say the New York Post story was false? Senator, not about that story specifically. Why did you throw it all back? Why did, why did you throw it all back? They alerted us of a to be on heightened alert around a risk of hack and leak operations around a, a release you're, you're, of information. So the FBI had said, hey, there's going to be a hacked story that comes out. That's what they told to Facebook. And so now here's the new chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan of Ohio, questioning Yoel Roth, who is the former global head of trust and safety at Twitter. This is in the February 8th hearing of this year. And just so you know, FEC is the Federal Election Commission. Uh, Mr. Roth, I want to go back to your statement in your, in your declaration to the FEC. I learned that a hack and leak operation would involve Hunter Biden. Who did you learn that from? My recollection is it was mentioned by another technology company in one of our joint meetings, but I don't recall specifically whom. You don't know the person's name? I don't even recall what company they worked at. No, this was a long time ago. And you're, you're confident that it was from uh, a tech company, not from someone from the government? To the best of my recollection, yes. Did anyone from the government in these periodic meetings you have, did they ever tell you that a hack and leak operation involving Hunter Biden was coming? No. Did, they, not... did, did Hunter Biden's name come up at all in these meetings? Yes, his name was raised in those meetings, but not by the government, to the best of my recollection. So the FBI told Facebook to be on the lookout for a hack and leak operation. And then Twitter heard the hack and leak is coming rumor and Hunter Biden's name was thrown around in a meeting with the other social media companies, a meeting that Facebook was in. So, I mean, looking at the bigger picture and I'm using the Twitter files to do this. But we know that the FBI knew that the Hunter Biden laptop existed, obviously because they had the laptop and they knew that Trump's toady Rudy Giuliani had access to it. And so when the story was released via Giuliani to the New York Post, the people at the social media companies had their spidey senses heightened and triggered. And like I said, I'm using the Twitter files to give you this information. There's a lot more details in the Twitter files if you want to see them. But I really don't want to get into the weeds on this. The Twitter files journalists basically referred to the FBI's actions in this story, which went on for a year, as a pre-bunking of the laptop story. And I think that's a pretty good description of what happened. And so when the Hunter Biden laptop story was released by the New York Post, here's Yoel Roth, who was the former global head of trust and safety at Twitter. In 2020, Twitter noticed activity related to the laptop that at first glance bore a lot of similarities to the 2016 Russian hack and leak operation targeting the DNC. And we had to decide what to do. And in that moment, with limited information, Twitter made a mistake. And it cannot be overemphasized how critical the 2016 hacks of John Podesta and the DNC were. The hacks that the Democratic Party blames to this day for Hillary Clinton's loss to Donald Trump in 2016. The number one most influential part of the Russian active measures campaign in 2016 was the hack and leak targeting John Podesta. It would have been foolish not to consider the possibility that they would run that play again. And just the framing of this whole situation. It isn't obvious what the right response is to a suspected but not confirmed cyber attack by another government on a presidential election. I believe Twitter erred in this case because we wanted to avoid repeating the mistakes of 2016. Twitter executives framed hacked emails that exposed truths about corruption within the Democratic Party, a party exposed for essentially tipping the scales, rigging, if you will, their own primary to favor a particular candidate. That rigging isn't the attack on our election. Oh, no, it's the exposure of that rigging. That's the attack. 
In the minds of these elites, allowing that exposure is the, quote, mistake of 2016, unquote. And if you exist in that bubble, if you think that exposing corruption is what needs to be prevented, as opposed to stopping the corruption itself, well, this is where that logic leads. I think one of the key failures that we identified after 2016 was that there was very little information coming from the government and from intelligence services to the private sector. The private sector had the power to remove bots and to take down foreign disinformation campaigns, but we didn't always know where to look without leads supplied by the intelligence community. That was one of the failures highlighted in the Senate Intelligence Committee's report and in the Mueller investigation, and that was one of the things we set out to fix in 2017. And fast forward six years, and thanks to the Twitter files, we now know what their fix has become. Because the subtle pre-bunking of the laptop story by the FBI, essentially tricking the social media companies into limiting the reach of a true story, that's nothing, which is why I'm not spending any more time on it. The coordination and censorship between government and corporation has advanced way beyond that, in a way that I feel quite certain constitutes a violation of the First Amendment. Now, I've got to tell you that the hearing that Matt Taibbi testified in about this devolved into a total circus. Members of Congress literally got into shouting matches with each other multiple times. You know, I feel like I say this a lot, but it was some of the worst behavior I've seen in Congress, and I will get to that later. But because of the childish antics of way too many on the committee, Matt Taibbi wasn't given much of an opportunity outside of his five minute opening statement to really explain the significance of what he has seen in the Twitter files and not for a lack of trying. To be clear, Matt Taibbi did a fantastic job in the hearing. It's the members of Congress who sabotaged the hearing. I mean, I'm impressed with Matt simply for resisting the urge that he must have had to flip this committee a double bird. But where Matt Taibbi was treated with the respect he has earned and was able to have a detailed, nuanced conversation about the Twitter files was on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast on February 13th. And so here's a piece of that conversation with Joe Rogan that really helped me to understand the big picture. Has anything been surprising to you? Um, a, a little bit. I, I think going into it, I, I thought that the... Um that the relationship between the security agencies like the, the FBI and the DHS and companies like Twitter and Facebook, I thought it was a little bit less formal. Like, I, th I thought maybe they had kind of an advisory role. And what we find is that it's not that. It's, it's very formalized. They have a really intense structure uh, that they've worked out over a period of years where they have regular meetings. Um, they have a system where the DHS handles, um, you know, censorship requests that come up from the, st the states and the FBI handles the international ones and they all float all these companies. And um, it's a big bureaucracy. And we, I don't think we expected to see that. And so for more details about that unexpectedly formalized structure, let's go back to the March 9th hearing. And in this clip, you're going to hear a lot of abbreviations. And so here's what they mean. And I know you probably know most of these, but some people don't. And so real quick, he just mentioned two of them. First, the FBI is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is a part of the Justice Department that conducts domestic investigations that local police can't handle and that spy agencies aren't allowed to do. Then there's DHS, which stands for Department of Homeland Security, which is an agency that did not exist before the George W. Bush administration. When it was created in 2003, it merged 22 different domestic law enforcement agencies into one massive department, and it's in charge of domestic law enforcement. Then there's HHS, which stands for Health and Human Services, which enforces the laws related to health and welfare. And this agency played a central role in the COVID-19 pandemic response. Then there's DOD, which stands for Department of Defense, which is the Orwellian name for our War Department. And Matt doesn't use the abbreviation here, but he will later. And so he's also going to mention the Global Engagement Center, GEC, which, as a reminder, is a relatively new branch of the State Department that I next named the Ministry of Propaganda when it was created in December of 2016 as part of the 2017 NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. I produced a whole episode about it, episode 141, called Terrorist Gifts and the Ministry of Propaganda, because my spidey sense got triggered when I saw that its main functions 
would be to track stories that threaten the, quote, interests of the United States, unquote, which is often code for the interests of the elite and multinational corporations, and that it would be tasked with creating and distributing, quote, fact-based narratives, unquote, to counter the ones that the truth gods at the Global Engagement Center deemed untruthy. And it was designed to be tainted by politics because the head would be someone picked by the president. And while we're on the subject, I might as well play you this fascinating little clip from the March 9th hearing. Here's Representative Dan Bishop, who is holding a little tape recorder or maybe his phone. I don't know. But he is speaking to Matt Taibbi and he plays something into the microphone. Richard Stengel, you know who that is? Yes, he's the former, uh, the first head of the Global Engagement Center. I want the American people to hear from him for 30 seconds. Basically, every country creates their own narrative story. And, and, you know, my old job at the State Department was what people used to joke as the chief propagandist job. We haven't talked about propaganda. Propaganda, I'm not against propaganda. Every country does it, and they have to do it to their own population. So that's the type of person who gets picked to be in charge of the Global Engagement Center. That agency turned out to be just as sinister as we thought it would be. And then finally, you'll hear the abbreviation CIA, which is Central Intelligence Agency, which you probably know has been operating effectively lawlessly around the world, replacing the governments of other countries since it was created after World War II. And so now, here's Matt Taibbi using that alphabet soup of agencies to explain to Congress what he's found in the Twitter files. We learned Twitter, Facebook, Google, and other companies developed a formal system for taking in moderation requests from every corner of government, from the FBI, the DHS, the HHS, DOD, the Global Engagement Center at State, even the CIA. For every government agency scanning Twitter, There were perhaps 20 quasi-private entities doing the same thing, including Stanford's Election Integrity Partnership, NewsGuard, the Global Disinformation Index, and many others, many taxpayer-funded. A focus of this fast-growing network, as Mike noted, is making lists of people whose opinions, beliefs, associations, or sympathies are deemed misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation. That last term is just a euphemism for true but inconvenient. Undeniably, the making of such lists is a form of digital McCarthyism. And it's not just our country's government caught up in this public-private partnership of censorship. Here's Vijaya Gad answering a question posed by Representative Nancy Mace of South Carolina. Again, Vijaya Gad was the chief legal officer at Twitter before she was fired by Elon Musk. And this was in the hearing from February 8th. Did the U.S. government ever contact you or anyone at Twitter to censor or moderate certain tweets? Yes or no? We receive legal demands to remove content from the platform from the U.S. government and governments all around the world. So the whole world is in on the censorship. But here in the United States, one of the principal agencies being oh so helpful to the private corporations and their censorship efforts via making takedown lists is the FBI. Here's Matt Taibbi testifying to Congress. There were a couple of very telling emails that we, pa- um, we published. Uh, one was by the, uh, a lawyer named Sasha Cardiel, where the company was being so overwhelmed by, um, by requests from the FBI. And in fact, they, they gave each other a sort of digital high five after one batch, saying that was a monumental undertaking to clear all of these. But she noted that, that she believed that, that the FBI was essentially um, creating, doing word searches keyed to Twitter's terms of service, um, looking for violations of terms of service, specifically so that they could make recommendations along those lines, which we found interesting. And the FBI did more than just send emails. Here's Yoel Roth, the former global head of trust and safety at Twitter, speaking to Representative Kelly Armstrong of North Dakota in the February 8th hearing. Twitter met quarterly with the FBI Foreign Interference Task Force, and we had those meetings running for a number of years to share information about malign foreign interference. Agents from Homeland Security or intelligence or just primarily the FBI? Our primary contacts were with the FBI, and in those quarterly meetings, they were, I believe, exclusively with FBI personnel. So there was a pretty close relationship between these companies and the FBI. That much is clear. 
Old Twitter was also partners in propaganda with our War Department in a relationship that the Twitter files have proven goes back to at least mid-2017. In this next clip, you're going to hear the term whitelist, which within Twitter means giving an account verified trusted status without having the visible blue checkmark. Whitelisting basically gives that account a protection shield against having its tweets suspended or having their tweets shadow banned. In the Twitter files, we learned that the Department of Defense requested that Twitter whitelist Arab language accounts that, quoting from the email, quote, we use to amplify certain messages, unquote. These included an account used to say that drone strikes in Yemen were accurate, killing only terrorists and not civilians. They whitelisted an account promoting the random Syrian fighters that we were and maybe still are using to try to regime change the government of Syria. By the way, we bombed the sh out of Syrian territory just this week in response to a drone attack on a U.S. coalition base in Syria, a drone attack that was blamed on the Iranians, which proves, if nothing else, that we still have an informal military base in Syria for reasons that all just have to say are unknown. But back to the War Department whitelist requests. The warmongers in charge also requested that Twitter whitelist a government account pushing anti-Iran messages into Iraq. And the accounts that still exist do not publicly disclose that they are speaking on behalf of the U.S. government. I mean, the War Department straight up told Twitter that these accounts existed for the purpose of foreign influence campaigns, and they were government propaganda aimed at other countries, which is stunning because for the last six years, we've been told that the purpose of the censorship was to prevent foreign influence. And Twitter, for years, said that their policy is to shut down all propaganda accounts, regardless of which country they belong to. And yet Twitter whitelisted the foreign influence accounts of the U.S. government as confirmed by Yoel Roth, the former global head of trust and safety at Twitter. Here he is responding to a question posed by Representative Eric Burleson of Missouri. Thank you. Back to Mr. Roth. Um, is it true that Twitter whitelisted accounts for the Department of Defense to spread propaganda about its efforts in the Middle East? Did they give you a list of accounts that were fake accounts and asked you to whitelist those accounts? That request was made of Twitter. To be clear, when I found out about that activity, I was appalled by it. I undid the action, and my team exposed activity originating from the Department of Defense's campaign publicly. Can't undo what wasn't actually done. And so that's the confirmation. Twitter did, in fact, whitelist those Department of Defense propaganda accounts, at least for a while. But the point here isn't what Twitter did. The point is that the U.S. government asked them to do it. But I do have to say that Twitter was far too willing to do these things. In fact, the Twitter files exposed internal guidance within Twitter that directed Twitter staff to prevent advertising by, quote, any user identified by the U.S. intelligence community as a state-sponsored entity conducting cyber operations against targets associated with U.S. or other elections or an entity associated with such operations, unquote. And so basically, if the intelligence community flagged your account to Twitter, no paid amplification of your messages would be allowed, based solely on the say-so of spooks. And the Twitter files expose that the lists of baddie accounts that were submitted by the intelligence community were not all that carefully crafted. First of all, these lists submitted and found by the Twitter files journalists had over a thousand accounts listed on them. And the reasons provided by the spooks for why these accounts were on the takedown lists were disturbing. So, for example, as Matt Taibbi reported, included on the spook list of 378, quote, Iranian state linked accounts, unquote, were an American Iraq war veteran known for blogging about the war, a former Chicago Sun-Times reporter and a nonprofit independent news organization that I've personally learned a lot from called Truth Out, which I feel pretty safe in branding as a anti-war publication. And in a justification that is especially disturbing to me personally, accounts were flagged by the spooks for censorship if they highlighted anti-Ukraine narratives in the last year. Now, I'm not anti-Ukraine, not at all, which is why back in 2014, when almost no Americans were paying any attention to Ukraine, I was disturbed by and reported on the fact that our government, at the time headed by President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden, 
midwifed a successful coup in Ukraine that removed the elected president of Ukraine after he backed out of a trade agreement with Europe and instead decided to partner economically with their next door neighbor, Russia, which the elected president of Ukraine had every right to do. I was not okay with my government destroying the democracy of Ukraine. Ukrainians should get to make decisions for their own country, just like we should. And that's what they're fighting for right now. And I hope they somehow get that right to self-determination. But we did that to them in 2014. And from that moment forward, I have been following the Ukraine story as Congress provided more and more money and more and more weapons with more and more lethality and essentially built a new government for Ukraine that has proven itself willing to sell off Ukrainian assets to the private multinational corporations that have captured our own government. My sources for those stories were the coup plotters themselves. Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt from the State Department, Senator John McCain, Senator Chris Murphy, Joe Biden. And I got my information from the text of the laws that authorized and provided the money and weapons to the new Ukrainian government. Nobody gave a sh about that Ukraine story until Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine last year after eight years of civil war that no one gave a sh about. But since that long smoldering Ukrainian civil war went big time last year, thanks to Vladimir Putin, telling that true history has become taboo. And now I can see from actual Twitter documents that people telling that true story have in fact been shadow banned, some of whom have far fewer followers than I do. And so I'm sitting here reading this in the Twitter files, and I can't help but wonder if my account was included on one of these lists. Because I have talked repeatedly about the 2014 Ukraine coup on Jesse Ventura's TV show over the years. And I did so more recently on Brianna Joy Gray's Bad Faith podcast. And I may have even brought it up on C-SPAN. I don't remember. But those are some large audiences. And even though the information I have shared is true, talking about it in the last year has been equated with being pro-Russia. And as these Twitter files have proven, that has been grounds for censorship. And with me, that's just one example. Over the years, I've told many true stories that didn't fit the official narrative, that were inconvenient for corporations, governments, and politicians. I told you what was in the Snowden documents. I told you how the DNC rigged the primary for Hillary. I told you how the Commission on Presidential Debates helps rig the presidential elections to make sure that only Democrats and Republicans have a real chance. I told you what the Mueller report actually said. I highlighted a hearing about the lab leak theory six months ago when that was still not allowed in polite company. I've told you about campaign donations to politicians from both political parties. I have highlighted terrible behavior within hearings conducted by politicians from both political parties. There is something to piss off everyone in the 270 episodes of this podcast. That's why you love it and sometimes hate it. But that's also why you keep listening, despite your feelings, because you know I'm telling you the truth as I see it. And I can't help but wonder if one of the reasons why it's been so hard to grow this show is not only my terrible business sense and my willingness to piss off anyone when needed and my refusal to pay for any marketing, but also, <laughs> could it be that when I do speak online, that people are not really allowed to see it, at least for the last few years, you know, that thought is no longer paranoia. Because even if I'm not on the radar of the actual Department of Defense or Department of State or FBI or CIA or anyone in the government, I don't have to be to end up on one of these lists. Here's Matt Taibbi testifying on March 9th. And in this clip, he's going to mention CISA which is a Department of Homeland Security agency that we also documented the birth of on episode 113 called CISA is Law. Now, the CISA law created a government private sector information sharing mission and included lawsuit protection clauses to make sure that no one like me has any way to sue the corporations for being tattletales or for censoring me. That legal structure was created via Dingleberry on a three-month late, 2,000-page government shutdown preventing funding bill at the end of 2015. And it's that Dingleberry that provides the legal basis and cover for all of this government corporation coordination. 
Eventually, that coordination effort was formalized into an official agency within the Department of Homeland Security called CISA. And so that's what he's going to be referring to. And so here's Matt Taibbi. You know, in conjunction with our own research, there's a foundation, the Foundation for Freedom Online, which there's a very telling video that they uncovered where the director of Stanford's um, Election Integrity Partnership talks about how um, CISA, the DHS agency, uh, didn't have the capability to do election monitoring, um, and so that they kind of stepped in to fill, quote, fill the gaps legally um, before that capability could be uh, amped up. And what we see in the Twitter files is that Twitter executives did not distinguish between DHS or CISA and this group EIP. For instance, we would see a communication that said, um, from CISA escalated by EIP. So they were essentially identical in the eyes of the company. Uh, EIP, uh, in, by its own data, and this is in reference to what, what you brought up, Mr. Congressman, um, according to their own data, they significantly uh, targeted more dis what they call disinformation on the right than on the left um, by a factor, I think, of, uh, of about 10 to 1. Uh, so, and I, and I say that it's not a Republican at all. It's just a fact of what we're looking at. Um, so, yes, we, the, we have come to the, to the realization that th this bright line that we imagine that exists between, say, the FBI or the DHS or the GEC and these private companies is, is illusory and that it, what's more important is this constellation of kind of quasi-private organizations that do this work. And in the Twitter files, Taibbi provides a document that lays out the official reporting process, wherein a contractor sends information they deem worthy of censorship to CISA at the DHS, who then sends it to the social media companies and to the Election Integrity Partnership at Stanford, which then fishes for more censorship targets. It's wild how formalized this all is. But it gets even worse, because not only are many branches of the executive branch, the law enforcement branch, requesting censorship, not only are random private sector think tanky type groups, many of them taxpayer funded, making censorship lists for the government to submit to social media companies, but the legislative branch also has people getting in on the censorship game as well, with one of the worst offenders that we know of so far being someone who is currently running for the Senate in California, Democratic Representative Adam Schiff. And until the Republicans took over the House of Representatives, he was the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. And here's Matt Taimi explaining to Joe Rogan what he saw related to Adam Schiff. I was especially shocked by uh, an email from uh, a, a staffer for Adam Schiff, the congressperson, the, the California congressman. And they're just outright saying, we would like you to suspend the accounts of this journalist and anybody who retweets information about this committee. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, yeah. this, is a congre this is a member of Congress, yeah. right? Most of these people have legal backgrounds. They're, they've, they've got lawyers in the office for sure. Um, and this is, the, this is the House Intelligence Committee. And sure enough, there are censorship request emails from Schiff's office in the Twitter files. And Adam Schiff aimed for the stars with his requests. Adam Schiff's censorship request was so far out of bounds that Twitter straight up told him no, because he actually had the balls to request that Twitter remove, quote, any and all content, unquote, about his staff to, quote, include quotes, retweets, and reactions to that content, unquote. And it wasn't just Adam Schiff. Republican Representative Mark Lindsay asked Twitter to remove 14 accounts that he accused of being Russian, as if being Russian is a crime. But Matt Taibbi personally knew some of the people on this list and confirmed that they were not, in fact, Russian accounts. And then there's Senator Angus King, an independent senator from Maine, who wrote to Twitter and Facebook to flag over 350 accounts for suspicious activity, explaining that some of the accounts tweeted too often, mentioned immigration, commented or shared posts written by his political rival, and were against his campaign. Now, I don't know if those takedown requests were successful, but the request itself is the scandal. 
This is one of the most powerful people in the world, a sitting U.S. senator, using his position to try to get people silenced in order to help his own campaign. The fact that there is no punishment for that, that's the problem. And this is bigger and more important to each of us than selfish, smarmy politicians trying to use the censorship partnership program to help themselves. Some of the censorship was of the kind that had real health consequences for each and every one of us. Because the situation that bothered me the most started on August 27th, 2021, when a former Food and Drug Administration commissioner tweeted correctly, it turns out, that natural immunity after a COVID infection was superior to vaccine protection. And it called on the White House to, quote, follow the science, unquote, and exempt people with natural immunity from upcoming vaccine mandates. And as someone who spent a significant portion of the early part of 2022 in Europe, including two weeks in a partial COVID lockdown in Lisbon, Portugal, I can tell you that in other countries, there are cards for people with natural immunity, cards given to people that prove that they have recovered from COVID. And they were just as valid for travel, restaurant and store entry, everything as the vaccine cards were. In other countries, this idea that natural immunity was equal to vaccines isn't even controversial based on the science. But here in America, Dr. Scott Gottlieb didn't like that tweet. At the time, Scott Gottlieb was on the board of directors at Pfizer. So he was a private citizen, but one with former high ranking government experience, as he was also a former FDA commissioner, having run the agency during the early Trump years. If people listened to the other former FDA commissioner and skipped the vaccine after recovering from COVID, that could hurt the sales of Pfizer's COVID mRNA vaccines. Now, within Twitter, a strategic response analyst quickly found that the tweet did not violate any of the company's misinformation rules. But Twitter wound up flagging the tweet anyway, putting a misleading tag on it and preventing almost anyone from seeing it. And that was in the summer of 2021. The boosters came out months after that. And had it been widely known that natural immunity after recovery was just as protective as the vaccine, I think some of us would have made different choices about whether or not to get those boosters. And on top of that, here's Matt Taibbi testifying to Congress. We found just yesterday a tweet from um, the, the Virality Project at Stanford, which was partnered with a, new, a number of government agencies on Twitter, where they talked explicitly about um, censoring stories of true vaccine side effects um, and other true stories that they felt uh, encouraged hesitancy. Now, the important... The, Censoring true. Yeah, so they use the word true three times uh, in this email. And what's, what's notable about this is that it reflects the fundamental misunderstanding of this whole disinformation complex, anti-disinformation complex. They believe that ordinary people can't handle... Uh, difficult truths. And so they think that they need minders to separate out things that are controversial or difficult um, for them. And that's, again, that's totally contrary to what America is all about, I think. And so this issue isn't all about politics. This affects our health. This affects our lives because knowledge is power and they took that power away from us. This is so dangerous to have people with no medical background whatsoever empowered to determine what information we can and cannot see from medical experts about a substance that we were being encouraged to inject into our arms and the side effects of those injections. Throughout the entire pandemic, throughout the entire last decade, Twitter has been my go-to source for information. That's why it's the only social media that I engage with regularly and where I have any following at all. I was using it constantly to get information for my family during COVID, specifically because I thought I was getting information directly from experts. To know that information was hidden for me because of this takedown request network that hides information that doesn't fit into an official narrative, I am personally enraged by this. And quite frankly, it makes me trust the vaccines a whole lot less, not more. And so just from a strategic community health standpoint, if the goal is to get everyone to get vaccinated, trust is essential. Eroding trust by hiding information is the absolute wrong way to go about it. But what's most disturbing about all of this to me is how many members of Congress just simply don't get it. 
How many members of Congress seem to believe that the fact that we are seeing this information about the censorship is the problem? That the erosion of trust comes from the Twitter files and not from the censorship itself. As if if we didn't know about this, all would be fine. And what I'm going to say right now is going to sound partisan, but it's the truth. All of the people who just didn't get it were Democrats. And I'm going to show you. Listen to this. This is Stacey Plaskett of Florida, the ranking member on the weaponization of the federal government committee, the highest ranking Democrat on that committee. We know this is because at the first hearing, the chairman claimed that big government and big tech colluded to shape and mold the narrative and suppress information and censor Americans. This is a false narrative. We're engaging in false narratives here, and we are going to tell the truth. How can you possibly deny that there's been collusion between the government and tech companies to censor information if you've been paying attention in these hearings, hearings in which she is literally present? How can you say that if you have bothered to read any of the Twitter files, which you would think she would have to do to prepare for the hearing? How can you call this a false narrative with a straight face if you are taking any of this seriously? And she wasn't the only one. Here's new representative Dan Goldman of New York, who you might remember as the Democrats impeachment manager in Donald Trump's first impeachment, the Ukraine one. Yes, that guy is a congressman now. And this is what he said in the hearing. And even with Twitter, you cannot find actual evidence of any direct government censorship of any lawful speech. Which is absurd. I read the Twitter files and actually I didn't even read all of them. I didn't have to read all of them to find countless examples of government officials in their official government positions requesting information be deleted or hidden from search. And it took all of exactly 10 seconds for Chairman Jim Jordan to find an example to fire back at Goldman with. I'll give you one. Gentlemen's time to expire. I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the following email from Clark Humphrey, Executive Office of the Presidency, White House Office, January 23rd, 2021, That's the Biden administration, 4.39 a.m. Hey, folks, this goes to um, Twitter. Hey, folks, wanted to use the term Mr. Mr. He used, they used the term Mr. Mr. Goldman just used. Wanted to flag the below tweet, and I'm wondering if we can get moving on the process for having it removed ASAP. (laughs) And by the way, there was a whole segment in this hearing talking about examples of the Trump administration requesting censorship, too. This isn't a partisan thing. But the Democrats just like didn't get the point. And maybe one of the reasons why the Democrats didn't get this is because they could only see this story through a partisan lens. Here's ranking member of the committee, Stacey Plaskett, again. And the Republicans have brought in two of Elon Musk's public scribes to release cherry picked out of context emails and screenshots designed to promote his chosen narrative, Elon Musk's chosen narrative that is now being parroted by the Republicans because the Republicans think that these witnesses will tell a story that's going to help them out politically. But this is not a partisan issue. Here's Matt Taibbi. Again, Ranking Member Plaskett, I would note that the evidence of Twitter government relationship includes lists of tens of thousands of names on both the left and right. The people affected include Trump supporters, but also left-leaning sites like Consortium and Truthout, the leftist South American channel Telesur, the Yellow Vest movement. That, in fact, is a key point of the Twitter files, that it's neither a left nor right issue. And this is a thought he expanded on when he spoke with Joe Rogan on February 13th. We see reports in in these files of government agencies sending lists of accounts that are accusing the United States of uh, vaccine corruption. Now, what they're really talking about is pressuring foreign countries to not use generic vaccines, right? Hmm. And... You know, that's a liberal issue. That's a pro- that's a progressive issue. Uh, like g- the progressives want generic vaccines to be available to poor countries. OK, uh, but, you know, you can you can use this tool to eliminate t- speech about that if you want to. Right? Yeah. Like th- I think that's what they don't get is that the, the significance is not who the significance is the tool. Like, what, what is it capable of doing? Right. Right? How, how easily is it employed? And, you know, uh, 
how often is it used? And, 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 and they don't focus on that. And he's right. The Democrats had no interest in engaging on the substance of this topic. Instead, they spent so much of their time trying to discredit the journalists who have spent months digging through these documents and summarizing what they found for us. This next exchange, I, this next exchange was so fucking dumb that I just need you to hear it. <laughs> so for context, this hearing took place on March 9th. And that morning, Matt Taibbi publicly released more Twitter files information. Publicly. Available to every single person in the world on the internet. Also, the committee he was testifying to is in the House of Representatives, which is currently controlled by the Republicans. There is only one weaponization of the federal government committee. There's not two. One that belongs to the Republicans and then one that belongs to the Democrats. There's only one. And both parties are a part of it. And so when information is submitted by witnesses, it goes to the Republicans in charge. And before you hear this, please move away from any hard surfaces because you will want to bang your head against something and I don't want to cause any injuries. And so now that you are surrounded by fluffy things, here's Representative Sylvia Garcia of Texas speaking to Matt Taibbi. When you responded to the ranking member, you said that you had free license to look at everything, but yet you yourself posted on your, your um, I guess it's kind of like a web page. I don't quite understand what Substack is, but uh, that what I can say is that in exchange for the opportunity to cover a unique and explosive story, I had to agree to certain conditions. What were those conditions? She asked you that question, and you said you had none, but you yourself posted that you had conditions. No, the, the conditions, as I've explained multiple times. No, uh, sir, you've not explained. You told her, her in response to her question that you had no conditions. In fact, you, you kind of used the word license, that you were free to look at all of them, all 100,000 emails. I was, the, the question was posed, was, was I free to, to write about? Sir, did you have any conditions? The condition was that we published Sir, did you Twitter. have any conditions, yes or no? A simple question. Yes. All right, could you tell us what conditions those were? The conditions were an attribution, sources at Twitter, and that we, we break any news on Twitter. But you didn't break it on Twitter. Did you send the file that you released today to Twitter first? Did I send the? Sir, actually, I'm I did. You today. Yes. Yeah. You, you did. You send it to Twitter first. The Twitter that was one of the conditions. Yes or no, sir. The Twitter files thread actually did come out first. But sir, you you said earlier that you had to attribute all the sources to Twitter first. What you released today? Did you send that to Twitter first? No, no, no. I post. I posted it on Twitter first. First, sir. Or did you give it to the ranking member, to the chairman of the committee or the staff of the committee first? Well, that's not breaking the story. That's giving, yes, I did, I did give. Uh, so you the, gave all the information that you did not give to the Democrats. You gave it to the Republicans first. Then you put it on Twitter? Actually, no, the chronology is a little bit confused. Well, then, it's more then or tell less us the what the chronology time. was. I believe the thread came out first. Where? On Twitter. On Twitter. So then you afterwards gave it to the Republicans and not the Democrats? Yes, because I'm submitting it for the record as my, as my statement. Did you give it to them in advance? I gave it to them today. You gave it to them today, but you still have not given anything to the Democrats. Well, I'll, I'll, again, I'll move on. And I'll the information was f***ing public. The Democrats had the information. The Republicans had the information. I had the information. Kim Jong-un had the information. The whole f***ing world had the information. But more to the point, who cares who had it first? Well, apparently this dum-dum cares because after that enlightened exchange, she then went on to scrutinize the oh-so-critical information regarding which journalist got the information first. Here she is grilling Michael Schellenberger. Now, in, um, in your discussion, in your answer, you also said that you were invited by a friend, Barry Weiss? My friend, Barry Weiss. So this friend works for Twitter, or what is, what is her... Um... She's a journalist. Sir, I didn't ask you a question. I'm, I'm now asking Mr. Schellenberger a question. Please yes, ma'am. Barry interrupt. Weiss is a journalist. I'm sorry, sir? She's a journalist. She's a journalist. So you work in concert with her? 
Um, yeah. Do you know when she first uh, was contacted by Mr. Musk? I, I don't know. You don't know. So you're in this as a threesome? <laughs> and this joyless shrew didn't even hear what she said. <laughs> she was so serious about her hard-hitting questions that she didn't even giggle at her accidental accusation of journalistic porn despite the entire hearing room looking at each other being like, did she just say that? Oh, and the camera's on Michael Schellenberger. But I wish more than anything it was on Matt Taibbi's face because I have read this man's work for 20 years. I know his sense of humor is as juvenile as mine is, and there is no way that he wasn't pissing himself <laughs> when she said that. <laughs> but all stupidity aside, throughout the entire hearing... Instead of seeing the censorship as the threat to our country that it is and asking questions about it, the wrath of the Democrats was pointed in a different direction. Here is again the highest ranking Democrat on the committee, Stacey Plaskett of Florida. Mr. Chairman, I'm not exaggerating when, when I say that you have called before you two witnesses who pose a direct threat to people who oppose them. They said the journalists were the threat. And Democrat after Democrat wasted their time in the hearing on trashing those exposing the information as opposed to engaging with the scandals being exposed. And I feel like we're through the looking glass here because last year I was enraged by Republicans who dismissed the necessity of hearings into topics like tolerated and covered up sexual misconduct in the workplace in the NFL, and dog and cat callers, the Soresto ones, that have been the suspected cause of way too many pet deaths and human illnesses. And yet here we are in a hearing about the private sector serving as a subcontractor for a massive amount of government coordinated censorship in a clear run around the First Amendment. And it's the Democrats doing the dismissing this time. Here's Representative Melanie Stansbury of New Mexico. We are devoting an entire day to this conspiracy theory involving Twitter. Now, the mission of this committee is to root out waste, fraud, and abuse and to conduct oversight on behalf of the American people. And if you need any evidence of waste, fraud, and abuse, how about the use of this committee's precious time, space, and resources to commit to this hearing? The behavior of the Democrats was absolutely atrocious. And even in their dismissals, they missed the point because the point is not what Twitter did. We're only focusing on Twitter because Twitter is the one that got bought by a billionaire who wanted us to know about this vast network of public-private partnership for reasons unknown. I don't give a sh why Elon Musk gave the journalists these emails, but I'm glad they have them. I'm glad we know this. But we don't know what went on at the other companies, and they weren't bought by strange billionaires who want us to know. And so there is no reason to think that anything has changed in the other companies. But all of the companies, for what it's worth, are being put in impossible positions. For example, here's Annika Collier uh, Navaroli. She's the former policy expert for content moderation at Twitter. So basically, she's one of these people who takes shit down, who after only a year on the job was given this impossible task. With January 6th and many other decisions, content moderators like me did the very best that we could. But far too often, there are far too few of us, and we are being asked to do the impossible. For example, in January, 20th, January 2020, after the U.S. assassinated an Iranian general and the U.S. president decided to justify it on Twitter, management literally instructed me and my team to make sure that World War III did not start on the platform. That's crazy. World War III is not going to start because of tweets telling us about an assassination. It's the assassination that starts World War III. It's the coup that starts World War III. It's the invasion that starts World War III not us knowing about it. 
People in government are blaming the discovery of their actions for conflict instead of the actions themselves. And when you look at it from the company's perspectives, what are the social media company employees supposed to do when the government requests censorship thousands upon thousands of times? Tell the Justice Department, Department of Homeland Security, Defense Department, State Department, Treasury Department, Health and Human Services Department, the CIA and members of Congress to just f off? Would any company be able to withstand that kind of pressure or be wise to do so? I don't think so. This is a First Amendment issue, an issue of government censorship. And I think these two clips exhibit what the debate around this is really well. Because on one side, on team censorship, is Democrat Dan Goldman of New York. Of course, we all believe in the First Amendment, but the First Amendment applies to government prohibition of speech, not to private companies. And on the other side, on team Stop Censoring Us, is journalist Michael Schellenberger. I recognize that the law allows Facebook, Twitter, and other private companies to moderate content on their platforms. And I support the right of governments to communicate with the public, including to dispute inaccurate information. But government officials have been caught repeatedly pushing social media platforms to censor disfavored users and content. Often these acts of censorship threaten the legal protection social media companies need to exist, Section 230. If government officials are directing or facilitating such censorship, Notes one law professor, it raises serious First Amendment questions. It is axiomatic that the government cannot do indirectly what it is prohibited from doing directly. And I think that last point bears repeating. The government cannot do indirectly what is prohibited from doing directly. Because that's precisely what's going on on a massive scale. And so it's not Twitter or Facebook or Google or any other private company that needs to be cracked down on here. It's the people working for government that need to be restrained. It's the president and those he appoints and those that work in law enforcement agencies that need to be restrained. It's members of Congress like Adam Schiff and Angus King who need to be restrained. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. This is testimony from February 8th by James Baker, who is a main character in the Twitter files. He used to be the highest ranking lawyer at the FBI, their general counsel who then moved on to work at Twitter as their second highest ranking lawyer, Twitter's deputy general counsel. He's a living embodiment of the revolving door between government and corporation, which is why he was tasked with coordinating with the government on censorship issues while working for Twitter. Now, he was fired by Elon Musk when Musk took over the company because of Baker's role in pushing for the censorship of Hunter Biden's laptop story. But after he got fired, Baker told this to Congress. The law permits the government to have complex, multifaceted, and long-term relationships with the private sector. Law enforcement agencies and companies can engage with each, with each other regarding, for example, compulsory legal process served on companies, criminal activity that companies, the government, or the public identify, such as crimes against children, cybersecurity threats, and terrorism, and instances where companies themselves are victims of crime. When done properly, these interactions can be beneficial to both sides and in the interests of the public. As you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Jordan, and others have proposed, a potential workable way to legislate in this area may be to focus on the actions of federal government agencies and officials with respect to their engagement with, private sector, with the private sector. Congress may be able to limit the nature and scope of those interactions in certain ways, require enhanced transparency and reporting by the executive branch about its engagements, and require higher level approvals within the ex executive branch prior to such engagements on certain topics so that you can hold Senate confirmed officials, for example, accountable for those decisions. In any event, if you want to legislate, my recommendation is to focus first on reasonable and effective limitations on government actors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that sounds right to me. But my concern here should be obvious. First of all, one entire political party, the Democratic Party, at best doesn't get it and at worst is in on it because they really do seem to be wedded to the idea that Hillary Clinton only lost the 2016 election because we found out about how the party rigged the primary to ensure she would win it. It wasn't the rigging or her six figure speeches to bankers or her promise to go to war with Russia over Syria or anything like that that caused people to vote for someone else. Nope. 
To this day, they blame the information sharing. And because the information sharing is the perceived problem, information sharing must be stopped. So the Democratic Party right now is a problem. And they are on the wrong side of this one. They are the enemies of the Constitution on this one. (laughs) And what a position we are in, my fellow Americans. Because the Democrats behaved so badly in this hearing that they made Jim Jordan, the Republican chair of the committee, look like a voice of reason. Jim Jordan, one of the people who tried to help Donald Trump remain president despite losing the election. Enemies to the Constitution to the right of us, enemies to the Constitution to the left of us. My God, do we need to clean house. But for now, on this issue, Republicans are our best bet for legislative action because they perceive themselves as the victims here. And we can use that victimhood complex of the Republicans to our advantage and engage with them on writing a bill. But the Democrats... They need to hear a lot of anger from the peasantry on Team Blue. The good news is that the Democrats are weenies. They're easily bullied. And if you agree with me that they're on the wrong side of this one, they need to hear from you if you are in a blue district or state. Because this isn't just in the House. Remember what Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts said in the 2020 hearing with the social media company executives? The issue is not that the companies before us today are taking too many posts down. The issue is that they're leaving too many dangerous posts up. In fact, they're amplifying harmful content so that it spreads like wildfire and tortures our democracy. I'm telling you, the entire Democratic Party, with the notable exception of Ro Khanna of California in the House, has been saying shit like that. We aren't going to get restraints put on government officials and members of Congress until that confidence in the righteousness of censorship stops. And then another reason why I'm concerned, especially if this is allowed to continue, is that the censorship doesn't end at social media. The expansion has already begun. Here's Matt Taibbi. Ordinary Americans are not just being reported to Twitter for deamplification or deplatforming, but to firms like PayPal, digital advertisers like Xander, and crowdfunding sites like GoFundMe. These companies can and do refuse service to law-abiding people and and businesses whose only crime is falling afoul of a distant, faceless, unaccountable, algorithmic judge. It has to stop. And the 535 people in Congress are the only ones who can stop it. And so we have some communicating to do. And so the first and most important thing I'm going to ask you to do is to contact your member of Congress if you're an American. Unless, of course, you're pro-censorship, in which case, go watch cat videos or something. (laughs) And then second, as far as this podcast is concerned, as many long-term listeners, especially those who pay for this show and therefore have access to my green room know, I have struggled for a while now with feelings of doubt and even shame in how slowly this show has been growing lately. For years in the beginning, the show was growing steadily and I got used to a certain level of growth every year. But in the last few years, that growth has plateaued. And I wonder all the time if it's because I'm just no good at this. Then I listen to these episodes and I read your notes and emails and I I really don't think that's the case because I want the summaries of these hearings to exist. I want the connections between the themes that run between separate hearings to be connected and be presented in this format. I'm proud of these episodes and I feel like I'm still making the podcast that I want to exist in this world. But now, after reading through the Twitter files and grasping the extent of the censorship that's been going on in these platforms since 2017, and the fact that the censorship has been aimed at people like me, because while much of the coverage of the Twitter files has been presented in a political way, as if the censorship is targeting only Republicans, that is simply not true. It's targeting people who are independent, who share information that governments, corporations, and politicians don't want to be shared. And if that doesn't describe me, I don't know what does. And so while I don't have proof that the reach of my social media accounts and this podcast has been purposefully limited, because there were many thousands of names on the takedown lists and the public doesn't have access to most of those lists. And even if we did, we only have information coming from one company. And so I have proof of nothing. But we know from the Snowden documents that the government has been partnering with most of the tech companies for a very long time now. And so maybe it's possible that the growth of the show has been limited 
because its visibility has been limited in a non-transparent way at the corporate level. I don't know, and I have no way to find out. But we know now that a vast partnership between government, politicians, and the tech industry isn't a kooky, paranoid theory. And so we should use this knowledge going forward. And by that, I mean that expanding the reach of the show and the information within it is going to have to be a team effort. Because chances are that you are not shadow banned. And so if you share the show, chances are that people will see it. And to help in that effort, Claire, my amazing assistant, is now creating ready-made advertisements for our episodes on the Congressional Dish Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok accounts. And so please follow those accounts and share their contents widely. And when you hear an episode that you think someone else will get value from, please send it to them, whether that is someone you personally know or another content creator. Because I have heard so many times when I do get invited onto someone else's podcast, it's often because their own audience said my name to them so many times that they eventually felt like they had to check it out. And that strategy for the Congressional Dish Marketing team, which you are a valued member of, is going to be key. Because I can tell you that the times that this show has grown the most has been when I've been invited to be a guest on other podcasts, when I have been privileged enough to be introduced to their audiences. And just so you know, I'm going to be living in Austin, Texas for one more month until the end of April. And so if you know of any podcasters in Austin, Texas, who might be interested in the information this podcast presents and in the independent way that it's collected and presented, please reach out to that resident of Austin, Texas, share your favorite episode and let them know that Congressional Dish and I exist and that I would be honored to join them on their show anytime here in Austin, Texas until the end of April before I hit the road again. And please include my contact information when you do. My Twitter handle at Jen Briney is the best one to use. And thank you in advance for reaching out to your member of Congress and for sharing the show. I couldn't and wouldn't keep doing this without you. And maybe on this one, we can eventually make a difference. And if not, well, (laughs) I don't know what to do about that. (laughs) Okay, before I wrap this episode up, I'd also like to thank the producers of this show. Everyone who pays whatever they think is fair in return for the value you receive. Whether you're paying on Patreon, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, paper checks, Chipotle gift cards, whatever you use to pay me, I love, need, and appreciate you. Thank you so much for keeping this show ad-free for the last decade. And I'd especially like to thank today Joe Nack. Nach. Nach. N-A-C-H. I apologize, Joe, for what I just did to your name. But Joe is now the executive producer for episode 269, the last episode, about the National Defense Authorization Act for 2023 and Plan Ecuador. Now, for those of you who are not in the know, an executive producer of Congressional Dish is someone that pays a cumulative $535. And every time you do that, you get a real credit on an episode. And your credit on that episode moves the episode up on the most valuable episodes list which helps new listeners figure out where to start in their congressional dish listening journey. And along with Joe's final payment for his executive producer credit and congratulations on your credit, he also sent in this message. He said, quote, I would like to apply my EP credit to the latest episode on the NDAA. Your clear breakdowns on the world trade system and how so much global shenaniganry gets slid in through bipartisan big funding bills is truly invaluable. Even the modern version of colonialism by giving warships to countries like Ecuador and then requiring them to utilize our repair stations in the States with our manufactured parts is something that does not get stated elsewhere. Once again, thank you so much for continuing this work. There really is no one else digging into these bills and making the connections to the broader system. Well, thank you so much for supporting the show, Joe. I am happy to share the credit for that episode with you. Again, thank you to every producer of the show. I am so proud not only of the contents of the show, but our business model, because they might be able to shadow ban us, but they cannot corrupt us because there is no corporate influence allowed here. And uh, that's only possible because of you. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. We don't have a domestic spying program. They're content to fight in black and white despite the many in between. 
Polar ice caps aren't going away. We don't think we can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think it lies. But we're not keeping quiet anymore. We are so damn tired of being lied. Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. We don't think we can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think it flies. But we're not keeping quiet anymore. These bills represent common sense, bipartisan solutions that actually solve problems.